Hello and welcome to the 21st Century Work Life podcast, where we talk about leading remote teams, online collaboration, and working in distributed organizations. This podcast is brought to you by Virtual Not Distant, where we help managers and teams transition to an office-optional approach. Find out everything we do over at virtualnotdistant.com and check out our show notes and pictures of our lovely guests over on the podcast page. It's great to have you here, listeners. Let's get on with the show. Hello and welcome to episode 296 of the 21st Century Work Life podcast. My name is Pilar Orti and with me today is Maya Middlemiss. Hello, Maya. Hello, Pilar. Hello, everybody listening. <laughs> and uh, hurrah that uh, everything seems to be working today. Yeah. In the oh, <laughs> now. Well, yes, yes. <laughs> we'll gloss over any early technical troubles because I think we've I've got the string back in the yogurt pot for now. <laughs> Uh, apologies, listeners, because what's been happening for ages is that I just get too close to the microphone. I I distort. So if sometimes my sound is a bit weird, but Ross does manage to make us all sound as best as we can with the home studios that we have. But anyway, we are now trying Zencaster, which seems to be working. So any podcasting people listening out there, we've got this new toy to play with. Mm-hmm. And t- today's... Um, Today's show, well, well, we'll see. We'll probably get going for a long while because it incorporates so much stuff. We're going to be talking again. We're going to be drawing on the concept of communication in an online team, online collaboration, and how it does require a different mindset. It does require a different way of of interacting. And for some people, it's it's not natural, it's uncomfortable, and actually we don't think about it, it just never happens. So we're looking especially at at providing some food for thought for the people who had to adopt remote and are now continuing to be some kind of remote, whether it's the subset hybrid or whatever, and also maybe provide some space to reflect for the more experienced ones. And of course, we would love your contributions, more experienced ones. Pilar at virtualnotdistant.com, or you can go over to virtualnotdistant.com where we have a contact form. And then at the end of the episode, we'll uh, draw an article out that uh, we really enjoyed by Jennifer Riggins, which is very timely. So we've Mm. left it for the end. Well, actually, without going into it, the good thing is that it's timely and evergreen at the same time. So, yeah, it's wonderful. So, Maya, uh, I thought we could start just to to kick us off with with a tweet, (laughs) as as many conversations start. A tweet which actually uh, was, um, well, it didn't get many replies or many impressions. I don't know what's going on with Twitter for impressions, but uh, the reply was uh, really got me thinking. And the tweet I sent out was, over the last years, I've worked and collaborated with a wide range of people online. One thing that strikes me is that the rhythm of communication and the speed of the workflow becomes apparent. And I've noticed that when somebody's rhythm clashes with my own, well, I've noticed that. Mm-hmm. Is this something you've noticed? And uh, Saski, lovely Saski, who I've met through Next Stage Radicals, she actually said, well, I've noticed when it's in sync, <laughs> <laughs> which is great because I always notice things that are not going well. Uh, so, yeah, Maya, is this something that you've noticed or thought about or, 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 or what has this prompted? Yeah, it's a really interesting one because with freelancing, I'm obviously dipping in and out of loads of different teams and client relationships. And it's one of the first things to try and figure out really is what is their cadence of communication? Where is the stuff? You know, who do you ask about certain things or do you need to? And what's the, it's kind of an insight into the culture of a new organization, but it is, every team is different. And some of those rhythms, you get the feeling have evolved very organically rather than intentionally. Um, and of course, it ebbs and flows over time, depending on the activities in hand. I loved Saskia's later reply about when you're out oh, yes. of sync, it's like a three legged race um, <laughs> when you're, you're trying to match your step to somebody else because you're yoked together. And of course, it you know, the reason that it's a fun game is that quite often you fall flat on your face because you're simply not in step at all. Your stride lengths are very different. You might be trying to go in different directions. Um, I think that's an excellent metaphor for when teams aren't in sync in communication terms. 
Do you want to read her tweet again? Because we've got it. I had just the, that that nice thing. Yeah, she said, musing on your tweet brought to mind an image of three-legged races as a child. Just agreeing to begin without a leg first was a winning tactic. It wasn't about running faster, just about not falling over ourselves. So, yeah, she's reflecting on that intentionality, which comes with all online communications and collaborating over distance. You have to have some parameters um, just to get started. Yeah. And that, that's why for, for us, it's so amazing to be able to be the outside eye. Mm. And even, as you say, when you come into a team, because you you have experienced different ways of doing things so that you know that it doesn't have to be like that, like <laughs> other people do things differently. And even that is such an insight. Um, and I'm thinking of the, when, when I was thinking of this, I was think I, I think of opposite poles. So you have sometimes in teams where there is constant communication, either because we'll go into this in a second, um, either because the the task requires. So it requires for me to say, "Maya, I've done this," and you say, "Yeah, Pilar, okay, I've done that, I've done that, I've done that, and I've thought this, I've thought this," and, and therefore the conversations, the rhythm is very fast, and there's a it's mm. there's a lot of stuff going on all the time. Whereas there are teams where they've got used to either, like you say, organically or intentionally to, well, when I finish my work, I put it in Trello or I leave a note somewhere. I don't necessarily tag people to say I finished. I don't reach out. Uh, I have a thought. And instead of communicating it straight away so that people hear me straight away, <laughs> I put it in a document. So there's, you could already see that there's that, that difference um uh, just yeah. yeah it's like the spectrum between working out loud and visible teamwork mm. and there's sort of every there are so many other ways of making your work visible um without necessarily having to narrate it at the top of your voice <laughs> all the way through um but some there are times that that can be valuable as well or that certain kinds of very synchronous immediate updates might be essential yeah so this is this is almost like a reflection episode, I think. I don't know, because it's made me think of a lot of stuff. Uh, and you uh, shared an article. It's actually a newsletter from remotefabric.com, which has some which has some terms that I think could be worth mentioning right at the top. So right now. Um, well, the first thing we want to mention is asynchronous communication, that although people listening to this show will be mm -hmm. bored to <laughs> death of it, of both the name and the concept, but there are um, people who, well, maybe don't know it by that name. So asynchronous communication is all kind of communication where we don't expect uh, an answer or we don't expect the receiver to be there when we send our message out. So things like good use of email uh, and then things like Microsoft Teams and Slack when we use them as um, as asynchronous tools. Uh, but synchronous is the, the conversation in a meeting, for example. So asynchronous communication, we might talk about documentation, which um, is, is not really like big, heavy documents, but actually is writing down our processes mm. or, 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 or having our processes or conversations for posterity. So it's stuff that's there for posterity so people can access later. And, um, and I wanted to, uh, sorry, is there anything you want to add to, to those two definitions before I go into single source of truth? No, right? that leads very nicely into the idea of what you write down and where and why that matters. Yeah. So uh, the the article also refers to a definition from Dropbox around the single source of truth, which I think is really interesting to mention because we do hear this a lot, especially in, in tech comp distributed mm. companies. And I'll, I'll read from the article. It's a term given to the practice of bringing all business data to a single location. The idea is that everyone in that company can then make crucial business decisions based on mutually accessible data. That means there are no work silos keeping people from knowing important information. So this actually is at the heart of documentation, uh, I suppose. Yeah, uh, it's a really important concept. And it's one of those that's hopefully crossing over now from the tech world, which originated it, because you have to document software when you're making it. Um, now into business practice because it's such a good fit with remote work. People have to know where to look for things and it has to be accurate and up to date and the same version that everybody else is looking at. Otherwise, you're going to get in big trouble fast. 
Yeah, I think the concept is so important, like you say. Uh, however, I think that it's really difficult to adopt, mm. um, and especially because, like you say, the the way in which, well, I don't know how, like like you say, because taking it from you, because I don't have a clue about how software is made, but it sounds like it goes very well with the task. It goes, it fits very well the way of working. You've got to be documenting. Therefore, you're already used to working in that way. However, if we look at some of the organizations, I'm thinking of organizations like local authority, mm. government, uh, and any kind of other thing, it's really difficult to, one, know whether there is information that you can make available to others, even people in your team, let alone the organization, and also um, confidentiality. And then also because of the scale and the diversity of the work, you can generate so much yeah. stuff. <laughs> It's just um, the stuff. Um, and I think it's one of those things that is probably much, much easier to do from the start. <laughs> if, you're yes. intending. if you're dealing with legacy documents and departments and offices, and that information could be, I mean, it could be anywhere. It's likely to be duplicated. Some of it's probably not even online. Um, maybe it's the kind of approach you could adopt at a team level or a department level initially to just try and pull together a single knowledge base where there's a definitive reference and try and point at that single source of truth rather than duplicate it. It's much easier to do now. We have really good online tools for that kind of wiki development where you can point at something rather than copying it and refer questions to the right place. But I think in the remote context as well, it's it's this is like the digital office. And if it's confusing or fragmented or siloed, um, you can come in, whether you're being onboarded new or you're changing roles or whatever, and just think, I can't find anything. I don't know where to look. I don't know who to ask. If you're starting a, a new job in a physical office, somebody probably walks you around the first day and says, well, the finance people are over there. Um, the legal team are there. You know, HR sit on that floor. And so you know kind of roughly where to look or there's a an org chart on the wall or something if you want to find a particular piece of information. Online, we have to replicate that and make it navigable and searchable in a way that maybe can't be completely intuitive, but it should at least be learnable quite quickly. Yeah, and so I suppose what what is making me think is that we we can adopt the concept. Mm. For, for me, I'm seeing that we can adopt this concept of documentation as in, is this information that we have, is it important to have it somewhere where other people can access it? I mean, it goes to the heart of working out loud, of course. Um, and then see what that means in our organization. Yes. And, and, and it doesn't have to mean unlocking really confidential stuff. No, you know, no. Even if you know that all the HR stuff is in a certain domain on a certain drive, and you might be able to request access to a particular document if you have a legitimate reason for it, you know, but you it helps to know where it is in the first place, or you won't even be able to ask for the permission. Or even even a step back, you can have, uh, make sure that you know who to ask. Yes. So maybe the single source of truth is not necessarily having the information at your fingertips, but having at your fingertips who can mm. To help you with the information, and I think that companies, in ways, have had you know staff directories and stuff like that. But I think we need to make this a little bit more human. It's not okay. Who, what this person has this title? What does it mean for all the other employees? Yes. Why? What you know? What 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 information do they hold or what? Yeah. Or what whatever. what expertise or domains reside there? Because it might not even be obvious to you. You know that they they deal with a certain thing that you might one day come across in a project and do you shout on Slack and interrupt everybody because you don't know where to start or do you have some kind of mental map of the organization and where the expertise and knowledge in it resides is certainly really helpful if you do. And the other thing as well as at an organizational level that I'm thinking is that the other mindset is the mindset of working out loud. Mm. So we can we can go one way, which would be we we hold everything in you know either one document or one area of the internet or whatever. Or the other way is, of course, we can very deliberately communicate, um, write down and communicate things that we think are of use. So, for example, it could be that 
in our team, we've discovered that uh, this process has worked very well for us to keep track of how we're embedding the learning from workshops. For example, you know, we go on training and we found that in our team, if we follow these things, we really embed the learning from that day into our day to day. What tends to happen is that that knowledge, one, does not even get uh, identified in the team. So we don't even realize we're learning that. We don't name it. And also then we don't share it. Mm. And if we're used to the office space, then we're relying on uh, serendipitous encounters, coffee, blah, blah, for this to be shared. But actually in the remote space, we need to go, right, this is valuable. We've learned this. This is valuable to the rest of the organization. That's that's the documentation with a capital D. Yes, we need a, a handbook, uh, a wiki, uh, a git, whatever you call it for your organization. People need to think, oh, if it's about learning, what what have people learned about learning? And yeah. go and look there. Oh, there's a really handy procedure that Vilar documented because of a great experience that she had. Um, and here it is for everybody to use. But you have to know it's there or at least where you'd begin to look. Yeah. And sometimes what happens as well is we have interesting conversations, again, either in the team or across organizations that can be then lost if they are mm. somewhere like Slack or Teams. And it's also you need to develop that extra antenna to go, oh, this conversation, ah, we need to yeah. pull this out and stick it somewhere where it's referable to by everyone. And blah, 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 blah. Yes. And we do need those kind of ephemeral conversations as well. This isn't about trying to capture everything that ever oh, gets no, no. said, but it's about sort of curation of, oh, that's interesting. Or um, well, that could be relevant again in the future and managing to copy that out to a knowledge base or something where it's going to be searchable. Yeah. And of course, my money is going all over the place, but I'm even thinking that the, you know, we talk a lot about what learning and development, you know, what their role is, the new ways of learning and all of that. And I think rather than focusing on how we can do more engaging in inverted commas uh, <laughs> online workshops, actually maybe the role sometimes of learning and development is going to be to seek out where these conversations mm. are happening and making sure we pull them back and create those resources. It, it's a complete shift of mindset across the whole organization. Definitely. And it's really interesting to see, I mean, there are some companies building this now into contact center software, for example, where you have sort of context relevant employee engagement and training and things can be made to pop up if people say a certain thing or do a certain thing. And I think that's going to get smarter and smarter. People will be able to build these tools so that people get the information they need actually the moment they need it rather than having to look for it. Yeah. Right. So we've already gone <laughs> a little bit sideways from team rhythm communication, oh, but yeah. it's very, but, it, but it's completely relevant. And also listeners, if it all goes to plan, next week we'll release a short episode of a conversation I had with Anna Nievish, who is a knowledge management expert. And we talk about a lot of this, how, what she, how she sees that uh, there is a bit of a missed opportunity in organizations to capture the knowledge. So uh, I'll refer you to that. But if we go back to the, this thing of about different teams having different rhythms. And I might have something missing here, Maya, but I, mm -hmm. I have three points that that I came up with <laughs> that, that I'm on my mind. So what the different rhythms uh, in conversation, in communication in a team can be influenced by the nature and the progress of the task and the task interdependence mm -hmm. between team members. Then the perception of and the real hierarchy and within that, the level of autonomy to make decisions. And then finally, culture as in social, mm. more specifically, the social culture. Am I missing anything? Well, it may well all roll into culture, but I think there are aspects of, sort of psychological safety and comfort with seeking feedback um, or a, a need for reassurance. Um, I think that all comes into culture really, yeah, and expectations from one another. Yeah, yeah, great. So if we um, if we start with task, which I think is, is the easiest to mm. get our heads around, uh, there's I was thinking the progress of the task where we are at and the face of the task requires a different rhythm. So, for example, if we're developing a new product, we might have a fast rhythm of communication. So there might be lots of bouncing up and down of messages at the beginning, uh, maybe meetings, which require which enable for faster communication, maybe lots of tagging so we can make sure that people don't miss our message. And that phase includes idea generation and the decisions of how to move forwards. 
but then there can be then after that there might be a slower rhythm where everyone knows what they're doing they've got their own roles and responsibilities and people are getting on with their individual pieces of work so that might have be more of a quieter thing where there's less pinging <laughs> yeah. as in i post and it's a more general kind of what do you all think rather than maya can you look at this yeah or it might break out into people working on something together as a pair or, yes. or something that's true um, yeah, yeah. and it might come back you know there might be fixed points within that like a daily stand-up in a product team to kind of write what's everybody doing is anybody stuck on something and then you have those those regular beats and then everybody's quite independent in between but you're also really regularly in touch with each other so it, it I think probably teams that work regularly on projects which have a certain shape to them already will probably mm. get very comfortable with a particular kind of rhythm of yes the big brainstormy bit at the beginning kicking it off and then you maybe less interaction and then you come back together and then you troubleshoot and then you fix it or whatever and I th hopefully that becomes a rhythm that people adapt to quite individually quite quickly yeah um and then yeah and then the, the final phase if it's a project might again might require faster communication but I think also what you were saying about even throughout the day we might notice that yeah uh, and I think it's worth thinking if, if we start with the day because sometimes that's easier and thinking as an individual and as a team is this rhythm what we need? Mm. Do I feel like everything goes quiet throughout the day and that helps me or that hinders me? Or do I feel like I'm constantly having to be answering people and actually does that help me or does that hinder me? Yeah. So even throughout the day, yeah. We all have different personal rhythms and it starts with that self-awareness of knowing that Actually, if your best focus time is mornings, but that's when the rest of your team want to brainstorm and chit chat, then you might need to negotiate that a little bit. Yeah. So, I, as you say, that this is also about reflecting and 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 just stopping for a while and seeing whether what we're doing is what's going to help us uh, most. Um, Maya, just as just, 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 uh, side note, uh, you said you had like maybe some fires or something. Is there, is, is there noise behind you? There is. Yeah, it's big fiestas here in Valencia. <laughs> this is the joys of working from home. These fiestas have been delayed for two years. <laughs> so, so there's a certain amount of excitement. There might be some bangs or noises off going on. Yes. So I apologize about that. I mean, we're out in the suburbs, um, but I think there's, yeah, there's obviously... Yeah, the whole city is just fireworks mad. It's not even supposed to be for another week, but there's quite a lot of practice and gearing up. And this is something that will affect also the, which could affect the rhythm of communication in a team. Of course, we, this is something not in our list, which is context. Mm. Uh, and again, how does that affect us? And and does the context allow us to en encapsulate the rhythm that helps us, or actually, are we, do we have to be aware and make sure that it doesn't affect us in a way that's not, um, that, yeah, that's not yeah, suitable? Yeah, and really takes really. account of people having different contexts in a remote team. That yes. you know, you might be having a local fiesta or you might be having connection problems or all sorts of things might might impact on the rest of the team and you kind of all know about that if you're all in the same building but otherwise yeah. you've probably got to contextualize yeah. it a bit otherwise no one knows what's going on yeah and uh so okay well, okay okay good so we've got the task and with all of this going around it as well um and then as well as the progress of the task we have the task interdependence which is how much do we rely on other people to get our work done and again we might again there's no way that this might pan out we might have a team with a very high interdependence so everyone needs to know what everyone else is doing and needs to be in constant conversation but it could also be that actually there's a lot of communication that is not task-based because yeah. task interdependence is low. And it might be that some of that conversation isn't even necessary if you're really rigid about your documentation and procedures and checklists. You might be working very closely together, but you, you might be able to do that. I'm not saying that it's ideal to work without speaking to each other, but you might <laughs> not need to keep checking in or asking for progress if you have ways of making that very manifest and you have that single source of truth where the next step is going to be very clear and you can see where every aspect of the project is at through some kind of visualization so again it's worth thinking about how you can make the work visible rather than loud some of the time 
you you brought up such an uh, such an important thing as well that it's not it's not about this whole thing about documentation which many people when they first come across the concept are like well what does that mean we don't speak to each other actually what you're trying to do is you're trying to put the conversations that don't really need to happen so often mm. put them to one side so that actually when you do converse those conversations really matter yes. and they're of high quality and, and conversations just, aren't the best way to share information often. Yeah. They can be one-to-one yeah. and they're not accurate or they're not up-to-date or whatever. So have the factual stuff somewhere fixed and accessible and then talk about the why and the how and all of that rather than the what. And I think also if, if, you've, tran- if you've moved to remote r- during the pandemic really suddenly and your team already had this kind kind of rhythm, like very frantic rhythm as in most information being held in people's heads, etc. Mm. It can be really difficult. And I, I speak from experience now of some time ago joining a team where there was no information available to me. Yeah. Now, I don't know whether this was because uh, I um, my, my commitment was very low to that project, as in compared to everyone else who was on it full time. And so maybe I didn't have, but it didn't seem to me to be like that because a lot of questions of when is this happening? I wasn't being referred to a document or a planner or whatever. I was being referred to a person to tell me when that was happening. Yeah. Or you. the other extreme is when you're coming in to do a, a one peripheral, very distinct thing and they say, oh, well, we've added you to our Slack and our G drive and it's all in there somewhere. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and just, oh, God, right, try and figure it all out. And you are, you do end up asking questions that feel naive, but you, nobody's kind of stepped you through where to even begin with it. So, yeah. So it's, and the thing is that a lot of the time we can get, we can get by, mm. but at this it's not sustainable. <laughs> this kind of remote work at some point is not sustainable because people end up being overworked because half of the time that they have allocated to work is being spent looking for information. And then when you then come to have a conversation, then imagine you've scheduled like a social chat or a latte and learn thing where you're going to actually share some learning. Well, I've been talking to you all day. I don't really fancy talking to you anymore. Yeah. And the work itself can often suffer when things get figured out again it's not only inefficient but it can lead to a kind of mission creep or shortcuts or errors in all sorts of different contexts if if you know how to do a thing it's better if it's properly documented somewhere and people can follow the steps rather than having to figure it out each time they might well come up with improvements in which case yep brilliant add that to the process document you know improve the single source of truth but don't go off and make your own yeah and and the other thing, um, you've got a note here, which, uh, again, I think is really important to remember that if we are creating documentation with a big D, uh, and so we're turning some stuff into reading material, you say here, there's also, there also has to be a culture of reading stuff. Mm, yeah, people that, you know, we all know that when we look at the a lot of the stuff from the all remote, big, successful enterprises that talk about the different levels of remote work and moving towards the goal of pure asynchronicity. So much comes down to having a culture of writing stuff down and of other people reading it. Unless you have that, it's going to be really difficult because it's going to be frustrating for people when you say, oh, it's all in the document, but you know they want a quick conversation about it. But then you duplicate that 200 times and it's really inefficient. And somehow you have to get to the point where people will access stuff on their own and read a detailed process of how to do it. But quite often, I think people can improve their writing as well, um, improve their communication skills. And it might not have to be written. I think, you know, there are different, you could use screen shares, it'll loom videos or something. Sometimes you can show rather than tell just so long as it's accessible and clear so people can get each bit of information where they need it. But if you're sending out an update, right, we've changed the procedure on how to do standard whatever, then it's really important that people know that that's changed because then somebody who does a habitual thing, they're not going to go back to that wiki every time. They're just going Mm. to do it. So if there's a change in policy and somehow that needs to be a push communication that is acknowledged and received by all that they get that there's been a change, whether that's an email 
We used to be able to make emails urgent, didn't we, with a little <laughs> flag oh, there? I, I think hate that. that was long gone. But maybe you you would have something like a Slack channel dedicated to procedure changes, and you could put a notification in there, and then everyone who's seen it uses a React emoji to say, yep, got it. Um, and then that's more frictionless. And there's also the little things as well. So we've got, uh, there has to be, if we are if we are looking at more documentation, if we're looking at more um, communication online, and I'm going to deviate a little bit from, <laughs> from this, even if we are thinking, okay, we're not going to tell you that um, we want to move away because we've realized that actually we're telling each other everything all the time. And we want to move more to a, 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 um, a using a process to communicate work done. We've got to get used to taking responsibility for going there and mm. finding out. Um, because what I'm finding is that you can set up systems of visible workflow or visible work, but then I'm having to tag people to come and look at that. Yeah. So you've got to, th there has to be an agreement of taking responsibility for, well, if this, going back to the single source of truth concept, if this board that we've got is where we say what we've done, then I don't tell. I don't need to 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 tag you every time that there you know there's a change or something or something needs to be done because you should be coming to look. Yes, and I think that's really missing um, because I still don't think that this way of working is being taken seriously. I agree, um, and it it was interesting. Um, Cal Newport's book last year on a world without email. <laughs> which was only the first half of the title, but it's the one everyone remembers. And it was a lot about moving to these project work-centered ways of communicating so people know where to look for updates on a certain thing when they want them, um, when they're actually working on that thing or when they need an update for it. But it really it goes back to one of the earliest books about productivity, David Allen's Getting Things Done, that the only way you'll ever feel that things that you're on top of things is if you have a, a trusted system. If you know that that system is up to date, whether it's your own to-do list or your team's project management app, if people aren't updating it regularly or they don't know where to go when they need to know a certain thing, you're, you're going to tag them anyway because you don't trust this, the thing. You know, if you go back and say, have you not finished that yet? Um, well, they should know that you haven't finished it because you haven't updated the project board, but that only works if you all 100% trust the project board. So you're going to get people interrupting you when you're trying to finish the thing, unless they really, really believe that you will update it the second that you've, you're done with it. And in the meantime, you're better off having your head down and pushing on with the deadline. So it is about everybody believing in that system and trust. Um, it's on a smaller scale, our household Google calendar <laughs> <laughs> is the same thing. I've just had to be really bloody minded about it sometimes if it's not in the calendar there is no yeah. guarantee someone's going to drive you there girls <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know and if it, you have to look at the calendar and then put your thing in around whatever else is already in there because yeah. it's kind of first come um first gets the lift <laughs> and you it's it's got to be that level of trust but across an organization that's a lot and mm. it's one of those things people can quickly see the benefits of when it's working and will yeah. quickly lose confidence in the minute it goes a tiny bit out of date. Yeah. And I think if we're leading a team or if we're the one uh, who's implementing some of that, um, it, we also change need to change our mindset. And it, instead of, okay, how do I keep people motivated or how do I make sure everyone's doing the work? It's about what's the ecosystem that we can create so mm -hmm. that everyone can self-organize uh, rather than always coming to you to say that something's done or asking you for information, yeah. et cetera. It's got to feel non-clunky. It's got to feel frictionless and kind of have incentives built into it that you need to update this dashboard, but you also need to go there to look for the next thing. So it, there's a lot of design questions here, I think. And there are so many brilliant collaboration apps out there. There's actually far too many of them. <laughs> so mm. figuring out which one is going to work for your team or how you can adapt it to best work is always going to be a challenge. But it's great to see so much competition and development out there. Mm. Yeah. So that's another another thing is that, and it doesn't mean that we lose the humanity because I know that mm. a lot of us who lead teams love working with people and that's the whole point. But as, as Maya says, it's just building something around it that enables us to, to do the work and to, 
trust not just the system, but also also each other within that. Mm. Um, or, or not to have to worry about trusting other people as much, like we always say, because for some people it's quite hard. So I think that uh, we can we can find ways in which we're communicating and, and with some level of autonomy as well. Absolutely. Yeah, we talk in the crypto world about trustless systems, which mm. sounds horrible. It means not having to trust because it's all there. Um, and some things just sort of provide their own intrinsic verification when you look at them. And that does goes back to the psychological safety thing as well, that if people have figured out a way to do something more efficiently, you know, do they feel competitive with their teammates that they want to keep their process to themselves or they've maybe worked out a shortcut or a way to earn more commission or, or get their work finished earlier or whatever. There has to be this culture of sharing good things, whether that's learning or insights or whatever that, and that everybody wants to make things better for everybody. I'm going to pick up on that and then I'm going to move us on. But you've mentioned, I mean, none of this works without psychological safety. We've we've got it in point three under social culture. But mm. yeah, please, listeners, don't think that we're not aware of this. <laughs> we Unfortunately, we're taking it for granted. So that the first thing is, if there is no psychological safety, that's what you've got to work on before you start to get everyone to 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 put in the open that they have or haven't done something. Mm. Um, and, and, as, and as Maya said, uh, we, we started talking about autonomy. So I think if we pick up the second point, which affects, <laughs> we're mixing a lot of stuff. We're talking about team rhythm, but of course it just, it, it, it yeah, it, it just brings out loads of other, uh, other stuff we need to talk about. Um, and we look at, when we look at a hierarchy or sense of hierarchy or real hierarchy and the autonomy that people have to make decisions, because one of the things, one of the reasons why we might have loads of, hey, tag, hey, tag, hey, tag, is that we don't feel like we have the authority to make decisions on our own or even the information to do, mm. to take decisions on our own. Yes. And uh, all of those things, again, you can streamline so many operational things just by setting some guidelines in place. I can't remember which corporation it was that decided a decade ago that all their customer service agents on the phone had the discretion to make any refund under $100 mm. or something. So it was just about, and then it reduced their manager queries by 70% or something, because it was mostly about this to and fro. Well, he says this, oh, I don't know about that. And instead, just leave it to the person in the conversation. And it actually saved them so much money, even though they gave more refunds, they processed more calls mm -hmm. um, just by giving people that operational responsibility and feeding their intrinsic motivation and, and all of that by giving them that discretion. So it, it really does matter whether if you're in the kind of organization where people feel they've got to check everything before they make a move, uh, that's really slow. And it's, it's going to cause friction that's bound to affect every aspect of what you're doing. Yeah. And on the other side of the of the spectrum, if you've also got uh, a culture where everyone feels like because no one can see what they're doing, they've got to be telling us what they've been doing all mm. day, that also is generating noise. And what we're trying to see here is to identify the kind of communication that is noise yeah. versus the kind of communication that is necessary and useful. Yes, absolutely. Um, and Working out loud can get very noisy if everybody feels they've got to shout about what they're doing at the top of their voice. Otherwise, they'll be judged as unproductive or not present or something. They might be picking up insecurities from a manager who didn't want people working from home or, you know, there could be all sorts of reasons why why this can become the culture of who shouts the loudest is deemed the most productive um, and it might not correlate to what they're actually producing. Yeah. And this sense of... Uh also hierarchy and versus autonomy is the the traditional sense that actually information is only held in certain areas of the organization and if we go back to our conversation right at the beginning is uh, where what is the information that everyone needs to have access to to do their to do their job as best as possible and making that available sometimes if sometimes for some organizations it's uh, it's tricky and something they're not used to yeah, and it can be that, you know, there's there are things that got figured out, maybe not in the best way. There are things that were trial and error. Um, there are solutions that one team has found that works and another doesn't. There could be shadow IT involved. People have downloaded something that's actually really helpful to them, but it's not official um, and they're on a free account or a shared account or something which their IT department might not endorse. And it could I think obviously this came to the fore during the pandemic when people were doing whatever they could just to keep afloat and, you know, keep their business going. I think a lot of 
teams and organizations got saved by people who were prepared to be a little bit experimental and do things that probably their manager or their IT department would have given them a slap for if they'd known, mm. um, or it would have had to go through months of approvals and, and layers of, of answers and things. And instead they thought, ah, oh, figured out a way to do this without being in the office. I spoke to somebody once who'd managed to replicate a whole office whiteboard that he took a photo of the day they went in to get their laptops before the lockdown. And he managed to replicate all of that on Trello just completely independently. And that was the only thing that kept the sales team going. Mm -hmm. Uh, But there was no IT provision for that. And he had to Google, you know, how do I do like an online board that I can move things around and (laughs) came up with the solution. It wasn't documented anywhere. And if he left, you know, that was on his personal Trello account. So it all would have just fallen over. Or you can also see the the kind of scenario where that happens. He tells someone in another department, mm. that person tells someone else in another department, and suddenly he's getting like 10,000 messages coming, yeah. hey, how did you do that? Yeah, can you just drop everything and help me do that? <laughs> yes. Whereas if there is a culture of, hang on, this is really interesting, I'm allowed to experiment, I'm allowed to figure things out, and actually I don't need to be in a high layer of, a, of the organization to share this, here you go. And then suddenly yeah. all those thousands of people can go somewhere instead of sending the expert all those pings. Mm, yeah. And he's obviously the people who tend to figure their way out through this tend to be in demand, um, particularly yeah. at the moment. Yeah. So again, if we look at this from the team leader's point of view, I think, again, it's another mindset of what can I do so that constantly people can support each other? What questions should they be able to answer themselves rather than, so we take, I mean, Maya, you made a note, would you take the the coaching approach Mm. and you do that very deliberately to the point of making it explicit sometimes to the point of documenting some of those answers so that, because it feels very different um, to say, oh, I don't know how to do this. Hey, can you help me to, Oh, I don't know how to do this. I'll go and look here and then maybe ask for help. Yeah. And I know that you mentioned before personality. There are people who will, by nature, and that's what they prefer to do, is to ask someone. But in a remote work environment, uh, it's uh, it's tricky to be doing that all the time. Yes, and this is going to become one of the core hiring competencies, I think, for a lot of remote roles is, are you good at figuring stuff out and working out where th- information is documented or even we're figuring out who to ask rather than doing an app team message and annoying 40 people um so i think it's it's going to be one of those core skills that we all have to develop is how to figure this stuff out on our own even if our preferred natural communication style would be to tap someone on the shoulder and say can you just show me this that might not always be the most appropriate way yeah And so let's go into the third point, uh, which is all about, I mean, we've said most of it actually about culture and psychological safety. And then, of course, many listeners who've been thinking about this for a while will be saying, hey, there was a study (laughs) a couple of years ago. Why haven't you mentioned it? But we we, we will. So the the final, um, so we're looking, I mean, you've mentioned psychological safety, that that is key, unless Mm -hmm. we can't remote work is, I think, Well, I don't know. Actually, this is a question because actually sometimes we find it easier and safer to come to bring stuff up where we're not fully present there Mm. or when we have time to think about it. So actually for some, in some instances, it could be that psychological safety is not as important if we're in a remote team. Um, but for some of the stuff that we're talking about, you've got to feel like it's okay to say this stuff. Definitely. And it's also interrelated to how hierarchical you are, what, you know, how competitive you are, how your your teams are structured. You know, what sort of role does the manager have? Are they there to give instruction and direction? Or are they somebody who can say, what do you need from me? And what's the most helpful way for me to provide it? Or a manager who can own that things might not be perfect, particularly in a post-pandemic sort of lashed up solution to say, okay, what do we think about this bit of what we're doing? How could it be improved? How could it be better? What do you what do you need from the organization in order to fix this? And it just makes a huge difference if people can bring all that to the table, even if it's a bit of a half-baked solution. Um, and they might not have to have it all figured out before they provide an answer, but they can provide a way to move things forward or open up the debate. And some of that psychological safety is also about 
not having to show that you're there fully all the time, mm. not having to show that you're working all the time by saying all this stuff you've completed. Uh, and I think that's, again, when when we can then have a rhythm that he- that suits the work and not just a culture that is a little bit dysfunctional. Mm. Um, I'm also thinking that in in maybe teams, more teams than organizations where there's lots of communication all the time, all the time, all the time, all the time, lots of ping, lots of ping, blah, blah, blah. That is, it could be about feeling, wanting to feel connected, Mm. like uh, more than even presentism or anything. So I think that we also need to recognize that and see what we can do that is actually more sustainable than, than people feeling like, Every 10 minutes, I have to see you, I have to know you're there. Yeah, and I think, again, if if organisations are going through changes in the way they're working on their locations, people need that little bit of reassurance. And sometimes if everybody is working, might be perfectly well on their own stuff. There might be lingering senses of what's everybody else doing? Um, <laughs> am I doing this right? And that, even above the social connection, there's a sort of work connection thing where it might be been reassuring to look across a shared office and see everybody there. And we need to replicate that online as well. Yeah. And also the the one thing that came to mind was Eva Rimbaud Gilabert in, I think it was in a Futuro del Trabajo in a Spanish podcast. She was talking about this culture of the hey you, <laughs> which is when you don't know something that we used to get, hey, what do you, and we've already touched on this. So that could be, I mean, when we're talking about culture, we're talking about all these things, how do people ask for help? Um, and if you have that in the online space, again, if we're all the time hey youing, it's it's exhausting. Yeah, and it's much less sort of contextually protected. I think, again, if you're in a shared office, you can look up and see that somebody's mm. paused and they've also looked up at the same time. And that might be a good moment for a peripheral hey you rather than yes. when they're face down in a complex spreadsheet or something. So. Yeah, yeah. So talking about this, so... Uh, I mean, what, what we're, I think, suppose what we're trying to say is think about this. This is important. It might, it's probably more important than when you're co-located is what's your communication rhythm doing is, are you transporting lots of noise into the online space uh, and just seeing what kind of rhythm you've got and whether that's what suits best your team, your task, your culture, um, et cetera, and whether it's sustainable. Is it sustainable in the online space? So in um, so 28th of October, 2020, there was an article that came out on the HBR online, and we'll put the link in the show notes, called Successful Remote Teams Communicate in Bursts. And it's by Christophe Riedel and Anita williams Woolley. And I think it'd be interesting just to pull out a couple of things, uh, like bursts of rapid fire communication with longer periods of silence in between are characteristic of successful teams. Bursts help to focus the energy, develop ideas, get closure on specific questions. Mm. So I, I, yeah, I found that very interesting. Yes. And I think for a lot of people who are missing face-to-face interaction, it might provide some kind of connection, emotional substitute for that as well. If you have your conversations, your communications in bursts, you can kind of multiply the energy and synergize a little bit, get that buzz feeling that you might have got from being together. Um, And you could, as a manager, you could think about your communication needs and how to promote that a bit. Maybe have one meeting where you, you cover a number of things quite quickly or have an online brainstorming session or something just to give people that buzz if they're missing it. Yeah. Uh, yes. And I'm also thinking that it's it's one way of acknowledging an aspect of diversity that mm. uh, often gets uh, forgotten about, which is the difference in how much we want to be in constant communication with others and how much do we need time on our own and how much do we need time with others. So it's this is a really nice way of acknowledging these diversities by having different moments. Mm. Um, the, the article did say that um, it's that sometimes these don't need to be said in advance. Like we don't need to decide, okay, we're going to do this at this time. But that actually, this is a point you made earlier, Maya, that we can see what's going on organically uh, and and maybe formalize it a bit more, what is helping us just to make sure it's easier to do. Or it can be, it can emerge by sharing availability. So if we yeah. have, like we say, an, a, a way of showing when we are fully available to others, not emergencies, as a different conversation, mm-hmm. um, then then it's easier to to have these bursts yeah. organically. And to identify them and kind of pick them out and say, all right, it looks like everybody would 
you know, it looks like it'd be good to have a manager office hours at 3 p.m. or or something and or to have our team stand up at eight o'clock in the morning. And it, equally, it has to be psychologically safe to say, I don't do eight o'clock in the morning. <laughs> I haven't got nearly enough coffee in all the world um, to contribute meaningfully then. And and to kind of negotiate when you're going to have these these synchronous moments so that everybody gets the most out of it. You might have to shift them around as well, particularly if you've got people in different time zones. Yeah. And synchronous moments don't need to be meetings. Mm. I think it's really important. It could be just that we we are there and we know that communication, com- that we can expect each other to reply almost instantly. Yeah, you have um, like a live chat almost in, in, yeah. your, in your Slack or your Teams, um, yeah. just something where you shift the expectation to immediacy. Exactly. And I just wanted to uh, me- uh, mention here, there was a thread on LinkedIn where someone was talking about the status buttons in Teams, which of course Slack has had for ages and they're busy, blah, blah. And as always, everything has a good and a bad. And the point he was making was that this was all about um, how it's controlling and how people want to appear busy and stuff. And uh, we were saying, well, <laughs> I think Anna Nievesh actually um, mentioned that there as well. Well, this is about communicating availability. And as always, we can use it for good or for bad. Absolutely. The technology is usually neutral. <laughs> <laughs> really, it's the intent behind it. I mean, yeah, in the hands of a sort of micromanaging, controlling situation that where somebody's watching, oh, they've gone inactive. They must have yeah. left that desk for 10 seconds or something. Yeah, that that is evil. But if yeah. it's somebody taking control of their own work and signaling clearly, then it becomes like a push notification from them saying, don't bother me now or talk to me now or whatever. Yeah. So finally, um, the, the what I love, this quote is great. The bottom line, I'm quoting straight from the article, worry less about sparking creativity and connection through water cooler style interactions in the physical world and focus more on facilitating bursty communication. <laughs> I, that wraps it up so well. Um, listeners, do go and read this other stuff there. You should read about audio versus video, but we are getting to the hour, which is always that time of time. Um, but uh, but uh, Maya, you have something to say about the role actually of technology and how it advances with all of this. Yeah, I just sort of wanted to wrap up by reflecting on the fact that there's an awful lot of information, when, uh, particularly when you add communication into it as well as all our documents and procedures and all of that that we've got and certainly when you're joining a busy online team as a new person it can be extremely overwhelming to think you'll ever manage to navigate this but actually the technology is moving to make it easier all the time Um, things like the ability to find a conversation that you had you can search, you know, provided you're paying for your Slack. <laughs> Some people have run afoul of that, but assuming the information's there, it's increasingly easy to find it. And now we're starting to see changes in terms of how conversations are documented in different platforms, even video and audio, a transcript might be generated in the background and then that's searchable. So you will be able to find this information more easily that somebody said something to somebody about how to do that thing that you do once every three years or or whatever, you will be able to find that again. For now, yes, we need better structures and ways to support each other in navigating the documents we've got. But over time, it's going to become easier and easier to find the information we need doesn't mean we won't talk to each other, that we won't connect with each other, but we might have less things holding up our work that demand that immediate hey you in order to resolve them. So hopefully that will be a win from everybody. Wonderfully put. So I'm going to uh, I'm going to swap one of these three things that we looked at. Uh, the different uh, team rhythm will be influenced by, first thing, we're looking at social culture, culture in its broadest sense, psychological safety, your environment, and that includes the tech. Then we've got the nature and the progress of the task and the task interdependence, and also the perception of and the real hierarchy and the level of autonomy to make decisions in a team. So with all of that, listeners, we'd love to hear what you think. We still have one item we want to discuss, but uh, Pilar at virtualnotdistant.com, or you can find us on our contact form, uh, which is at virtualnotdistant.com. But let's now give some space to an article by our friend, uh, Jennifer Riggings, which we think is actually both very timely, but also very evergreen.
So this article appeared in the new stack. It's called How to Support Teammates Living in Ukraine or Any War Zone. And it was published on the 1st of March of 2022, written by Jen. And what I loved, Maya, about this article is, well, for a start, if anyone like I, I am lucky I don't have any teammates or any friends that are at the moment in a difficult place, but this changes all the time. Absolutely. God knows it's changed fast enough this year. I don't think a yes. month ago we thought we'd be even having to ask this question. So, yeah, it's a really important, useful learning that we can hopefully not have to come back to too soon. Yeah. And it just offers lots of help, uh, lo lo lots of ways in which to help, just some key things to ask ourselves, uh, to to question ourselves actually also. Uh, and uh, it's just wonderful. Um, mm. and, and also if you are running a, a company uh, as well, it's, it's also got some points about the like offer paid time off by default. Uh, just things like sometimes it's really about emotional support, but mm. sometimes it's about really small practical things that are going to make life so much easier. Yeah, logistical things like making sure you found a secure way to pay people um, when they might be in an area that's under sanction or having connection problems and so on, giving people that space. I think a lot of organizations learned maybe the hard way during the pandemic. This is another thing that, that's probably not affecting their whole workforce where you've really got to, to look at what people need and ask them what they need, don't assume um, their needs might be different. But again, I feel a little bit like Thank goodness we have the remote collaboration tools that we have now. Then imagine trying to do this 10 years ago. Um, hopefully, you know, we know there are people arriving in Spain, um, even some in the UK by now, who are able to bring their work with them and carry on, even though they're refugees. You know, we can at least stay in communication. And if they're ready to work, we can give them work. And teams can cover for each other and look out for each other just as they would in real life. Um, recognize that some parts of the world are going through very difficult times at the moment. Yeah. And just this morning I attended, uh, uh, we're recording on the, I think it's, it is today the 8th of yeah, March. March 20, International 22. Women's Day. <laughs> oh yeah, it is international. We're happy International Women's Day, everybody. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, Rowena Hennigan had uh, an event this morning about well, uh, breaking the bias. And Lorraine Charles from, I think it's, Amal, Namal, yeah, yeah. She she mentioned. She said, "The at the moment, the refugee crisis is in this part of the world, but it's ongoing. Mm. It's happening everywhere." Uh, and kudos to the work that she does with helping refugees be great at remote work. Uh, so, uh, so yes, this is. <laughs> so we just wanted to share this article to say here's this is a great article, evergreen, and uh, we're always needing to to look at uh, at this stuff. Yeah, thank so, you for that one, Jen. Yeah, thank you, Jen. All right, listeners. So uh, <laughs> we will continue talking about uh, lighter, brighter uh, things in the 21st Century Work Life podcast. Look out next week, hopefully things might change. But for the conversation with Anna Nevish, where she talks about documentation with a capital D, but also the importance of generating visible conversations across the organization that are about the work, because of course the work helps us to feel connected. And that's why people are in those organizations. It is to do the work. So uh, hopefully that episode will be out in a week's time since the release of this. Uh, Maya, anything you want to say before I roll out the checklist of where people can contact us? No, another really interesting conversation. I hope people have got this to this end of it and enjoyed it <laughs> as much as we have. Excellent. So tell us, tell us if you managed to make it to the end on Twitter. We are virtual teamwork with a zero instead of an O. You can subscribe to our monthly newsletter with uh, monthly reading, uh, recommendations of reading and listening over at virtualnotdistant.com. We have a LinkedIn page and uh, you can email me directly if email is your preferred mode of communication. Pilar at virtualnotdistant.com. Everybody look after yourselves. A big thank you for listening to the 21st Century Work Life podcast produced by Virtual Not Distant. If you have something to add to the conversation, let us know through the contact form over at virtualnotdistant.com. I have been your host, Pilar Ortiz, and I'm signing off now. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, enjoy. Enjoy.